Yeah. So uh, another study I wanted to, in the adjuvant setting that's that's coming out really uh, is a new major data dump around microsatellite instability, mismatch repair, and prognosis and impact of adjuvant therapy. And and Howard, I mean, this study was uh, a retrospective look using the tumor blocks that were available with the uh, cetuximab adjuvant study, Folfox plus minus cetuximab, and when they peeled out the patients who by tumor blocks were mismatch repair versus not, they really failed to show uh, that better prognosis for mismatch repair, remember stage three now, um, nor was there any real difference in the output, so in the, in the outcome, so the chemo had sort of the same impact. So one thing we believe around stage two is that maybe mismatch repair matters, maybe chemo is harmful, we're all debating that still. Well, here's a big data set that really goes against that if we think stage two and stage three are cousin disease. What's, what's your take on that? Well, um, I, that's a, it's, it's a very tough question, mainly because there's not much data. I mean, I think that the consensus is pretty clear that stage two, the prognosis is so good that you really don't need treatment and perhaps fluoropyrimidine alone will be, uh, have a negative impact. But we don't really have very good prospective data in stage three, so, you know, if it tells us that we need to treat the MMR um, mismatch repair enzyme deficient patients in stage three with the same treatment and they have the same benefit, that's already reasonable information. I mean, I think it's an area where we've wondered what to do, so I, I feel more reassured when I see a patient like that, um, that we're, um, that we are making a good recommendation based on real data. I mean, you guys are big personalized medicine. Are you, are you testing everybody with colon cancer for mismatch repair of some, on some way? Yes, uh, every colon resection is reflexively tested for uh, MMR deficiency by immunohistochemical staining yeah. at Yale. That's, that's it doesn't matter the stage. If you're pulling something out, that's your well, policy? Well, yeah, if the, the primaries are always done. We have to request it if it's a stage four, yeah. like a liver biopsy or something. We but. are doing that. Fadi, what's going on out there in practice in U.S. Oncology in Nevada? Uh, uh, U.S. Oncology practice nationwide is geographically different, so mm. there is no standard recommendation because it's in partnership with local pathologists mm. and surgeons. We, in our part, uh, between uh, uh, Utah and California, we're doing uh, we're promoting for universal staining for mismatch repair deficiency in every colon. And here I want to put the pitch, an endometrial sample. Mm. Remember, a woman with Lynch syndrome presents yes. with endometrial first. Uh, that's for by IHC. Now we know if you do both microsatellite stability by PCR and IHC, you increase the uh, positive predictive value for a Lynch syndrome, but it may not be cost effective, but at least the mismatch repair is universal in all sample for the sake of the Lynch syndrome. Having said that, personally and our group, we're not holding, deciding on the adjuvant treatment based on the microsatellite stability. And this study for the stage three, and this study support that we should not, uh, at this point, I believe, to, to withhold any tre adjuvant treatment for the stage three based on microsatellite instab instable high or a mismatch repair deficiency. I mean, you guys know, Rich, I'd love to hear your comment on this, that I've been fairly critical of guidelines and all of us, and me included, of we get some data. It could be a small amount, it could be a big amount that gives us a lead one way or the other. Say the stage two mismatch repair, 5-FU is harmful. Other data sets don't show that, but we've sort of kind of adopted uh, that's what we think. I think it's on the guidelines, actually, that, that says that even though the data set's small and even in I don't think there's any comment one way or the other on on stage three and mismatch repair on the guidelines um, this is a big data set I mean this is a, a, a prospective randomized study that of course they went back and, and looked at does this kind of equilibration influence your thinking about stage two that what they saw on stage three and uh, on, on how you might see a patient with, a, say, a T4 or a, a bad T3 with a node negative and giving adjuvant therapy MSI? So I do believe the data that we published in the RIVIC article and subsequent articles in the New England Journal that suggests that uh, for patients with MSI high tumors, that five of you actually may be harmful. <clears throat> and as we get to understand the importance of immune checkpoints, it may be that part of that explanation is that we're killing the wrong cells. We're killing those lymphocytes that are uh, helping to uh, contain uh, 
are micrometastatic disease. Why do you think that wouldn't be true in, in the chemo is not bad in stage three then? Uh, so stage three, I think, is different, and there's data from the PETAC study suggesting that the chromosomal aberrations may be different in stage two and stage three. I, I don't claim to feel as though I understand it perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I see a new map of uh, the RAS pathway, it has 15 more branches, and so I think uh, uh, we oversimplified it when we thought it only had four steps uh, back in the old days. Right. Uh, but uh, there also is good data that uh, oxaliplatin and 5-FU is effective uh, in mouse-derived xenografts, or in, in patient-derived mm. xenografts. Uh, <clears throat> and I have no qualms about giving people full FOX. Uh, if I get a stage four, a T4 uh, stage 2 patient with microsatellite uh, instability, I am tempted to use full FOX in those patients. Versus just a five, if you right. Like. Now the one and other again, thing I wanted to—I'll pick on you a little bit. Based on what? Well, based on the uh, mosaic data, which suggests that those patients did have a greater benefit from full fox. But they, there no overall survival benefit. No overall of that survival group. benefit. Okay. Small subset of patients, uh -huh. uh, and based on the fact that they have a worse prognosis. Yes. Now I did want to talk a little bit about a study that we're doing at Ohio State called the Ohio Colon Cancer Prevention Initiative. So what we're doing there is we have 42 hospitals from around the state. We're trying to get 80% of patients diagnosed with colon cancer from the state over a three-year period. Mm -hmm. We're doing uh, microsatellite instability testing on all of those patients and then also doing additional genotyping to try and find out what those non-Lynch syndrome inherited susceptibilities are as well. But we're finding that many of the patients that I uh, don't fit the Bethesda criteria, uh, do have Lynch syndrome. And as a consequence, we're offering free counseling to their family members. Uh, and uh, we believe that this really ought to be considered as a population-based metric. It, it's done in uh, Scandinavian countries yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah. So it's one of the justifications I have for ordering it in everybody, even metastatic disease, because you may be picking up people uh, you know, the testing's tricky, though. You know, it is. You know, you've got, you know, the proteins present, and then there's gene testing, and even that's not perfect, and there are a lot of errors that go with that. So it does require some interpretation here. So, I mean, I want to make two points. First of all, stage 2 and stage 3 are a little bit different, and stage 4 is different, but the incidence drops off fairly substantially in each group. Stage 2 is 15% is uh, mismatch repair enzyme deficient. It's about seven or eight percent in stage three and only four percent in stage four. So somehow the fact that you don't have these repair enzymes may predispose you to get cancer but not necessarily to have it metastasize. And one of the reasons that you have a higher, the people with the more advanced stage, they have worse diseases, there is an association with BRAF mutation which somewhat attenuates the good prognosis and that's specifically seen in the sporadic um, uh, mismatch repair enzyme deficiencies or MSI high patients, not the Lynch syndrome. So we haven't been able to tease all those issues apart because there are so few patients. But yeah. there, there's a definite influence between the Lynch, non-Lynch families and the RAF um, mutations as well. Yeah, buddy. And here you're bringing a very good point, and to clarify, you know, for the audience, when we're talking about the microsatellite instability, instability high and the mismatch repair, preferably for two purposes, for the prognostic and predictor for benefit for adjuvant treatment, but again, looking for the Lynch syndrome. And I've seen often, you know, uh, that the testing, when it comes to mismatch repair deficiency by IHT or microsatellite instability, it's part of a testing process. It's very important to have in place between your local pathologist and the ordering doctor to have the appropriate reflex, like to go for BRAF testing, and if, uh, because BRAF V600E mutation can in induce a loss of the expression of MLH1, the somatic uh, mutation of the MLH1, the epigenetic change with hypermethylation, because otherwise we can end up doing, when you see mismatch repair deficient, without going with the appropriate testing, you go through a stressful, uh, uh, unnecessary counseling to the patient, and the germline testing that is expensive, four or five grand, which is unnecessary. So it's very important in the local community to reinforce a good strategy 
and education first and implementing it. Yeah. So Rich, you referred to this earlier and um, about this group of patients with mismatch repair, MSI high as we call them, that they, they appear to have a different sort of immune exposure. And of course, as a guy who's been trying to do immune therapy for GI cancer, your time for, is coming. Well, right. I feel ter I've been holding the torch, and everyone else got to blow it out. But Let anyway, me see, are your fingers burned? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. But it, it's it's merely so exciting. Singed. Merely singed. Yeah. So it's been so exciting to watch um, as checkpoint inhibitors primarily have come in and made some dramatic impact on traditional immunoactive cancers, so you know kidney melanoma, and melanoma, melanoma, but then all of a sudden lung, a subgroup of them, and it's, it's fun to watch, but I sort of felt like we were being left on, on the sideline. bladder cancer, yeah. I felt really bad when bladder, bladder cancer. cancer, when it worked for bladder cancer, um, I'm like, and, what about? And the other piece to this story that sort of, I, I, I thought, I personally kind of let us all down on some level is that, you know, we've known for years that the immune infiltrate of a primary colon cancer is a very strong predictor of outcome. And, right. and we They're just right couldn't really measure it well, right? We didn't have an assay. And, and finally, some groups developed an assay. We're about to have one that's going to measure it. And then we get this abstract uh, that I think you guys participated in the study. Right. So share with the audience this study, because it, it may be a game changer for colon cancer fairly quickly. Well, I think it is a game changer for colon cancer, and this is a study using uh, the Merck drug uh, pembrolizumab, uh, which is a PD-1 inhibitor. Uh, it uh, is easy to give. It's a standard dose per patient. Uh, the toxicity that we've observed in the patients that we've treated has been modest. Uh, the main side effects can be activation of the immune system, so you can end up with uh, immune endocrine deficiencies as well as immune lung disease. But it's not chemotherapy. Uh, and it, well, the patients that I've treated have had no toxicity other than some elevated TSHs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we've seen some remarkable results in patients with MSI high tumors. So I'll give you an example. I'm treating a 26-year-old who lives in Illinois here who's coming to Ohio State for treatment. When she first got there, she came in a wheelchair. Uh, within uh, two weeks of starting treatment, big neck nodes had disappeared. She had a couple breast masses. They disappeared. Uh, she had a background in theater. Within uh, six weeks, she was back to dancing. Yeah. So this was my first uh, real personal experience with the Lazarus effect of yeah. watching somebody who'd been terribly ill recover and uh, resume uh, their, their life's trajectory. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so far I've treated three patients, two of the three have responded. Uh, it's really amazing to watch. And uh, I'm told by the collaborators at Hopkins, uh, Luis Diaz and Dong Lee, that uh, the longevity of the responses is also startling. Yeah. So when you see it, you see it seems to be consistent across the diseases that you, you do get long-term Correct, and we're responses. not just treating colon cancer. Right. We're treating other MSI high diseases, so bladder cancer, uh, ureteral cancer, some gastric cancers. Uh, endometrial. Yeah. So endometrial. endometrial, of course, is, is uh, commonly MSI high and one of the manifestations right. of Lynch syndrome. So, you know, what, even though it's a small percentage of patients, only 4% of people with metastatic disease, uh, it's... I think equivalent to the finding of of the out mutation. That's what I was thinking. That's that, that's and the number for out. Right? And and you know we've been waiting for that breakthrough yeah. in colon cancer, and I think this may be it. It's a little carve out uh, yep. of patients, and and so with a drug I, that's I already wanna... approved too. You know, it's a matter of uh, right. uh, proving and maybe some more extended treatment that it's true. I, I just want to reemphasize: it's four percent of metastatic cancer. I'm sure when some of the publicity comes out, a lot of patients will be confused, and it, it really doesn't apply to the great majority of patients. But the PD-1 drugs in general seem to um, be going in this direction. I, I mean, this is the first report, but there are studies with nivolumab and also MPDL 3280 also looking at the same MSI high colon cancer population. Yeah, I think we need to be careful, though. I don't, I, you know, we're, we're measuring MSI on primaries usually. Um, things happen over time. Um, the immune response may change and chemo may make those changes. So, you know, they're having big debates around PD-1 expression, PD-L1 expression, does it matter or not? It's going to be a plenary discussion tomorrow about that. 
Um, uh, and I think the answer, well, that I know the discussant is going to say that um, it's, you know, it's the jury's still out on whether expression is going to matter and distinguish. So we have a lot to learn. This assay to measure immune infiltrates are coming. We're getting smarter about how to do that. We're trying to take advantage of this by combining vaccine plus these. So we've just gotten an approved study uh, to do that. So there's work to be done. It's exciting. There'll be an immediate carve out maybe of some patients and then maybe we pick up others through, through other techniques. So this paper will be uh, uh, online for the New England Journal uh, later this week so you can read about it in detail. So it'll come out further, yeah. Uh, one thing to add, of course, this is just the beginning of an interest because the checkpoint inhibitor have been notoriously disappointing in colorectal cancer compared to the urothelial, triple negative breast, head and neck. But at least we see some light that there is a subset where we're having some promising results. And the next question, you know, it was the discussion today with many sponsors about the checkpoint inhibitor, anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1, and combination, first with the anti-angiogenic agents and with cytotoxic. Nobody knows what would be the best combination. Uh, that, as you know, there is a very difficult uh, lab or mouse model for these uh, drugs to work, so we're going to go a bit of an empirist approach in the clinic. That's why we see an explosion of clinical trials happening uh, in this arena. And we encourage, uh, of course, physicians to refer these patients to be on the clinical trials to accelerate. And there are going to be more clinical trials than we can even enroll to. But it's a promising uh, era to look at the combination. I believe personally that we need to combine with other cytotoxic and angiogenic to have really meaningful. And of course, to find the magic marker predictor of who would respond. We know that's going to happen as, as things go forward. So maybe we should tell our friends at Onclav that they need a, a, a few of these primers on immunology. So those of us who learned it a long time ago could use a little refresher. So we oncologists are starting to be, to be immunologists. Let's uh, cover.